Welcome to the WRAL Daily Download. I'm your host, Allie Ingersoll. You might have seen these kits on Amazon or at Home Depot, or in my case, when scrolling through Instagram. Tiny homes in a box. Five on your sides, Pritchard Strong decided to start looking into them and see if they're worth buying. He joins us now today to talk about that. Hey, Pritch, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. So for people who haven't seen this story or maybe haven't even seen these homes, what are these kits? And even more broadly than that, what exactly is a tiny home? So the tiny home is going to be just a tiny home, right? Four or 500 square feet, um, really kind of like maximizing the living space and like how you can kind of tuck things into corners and, and things like that. But, you know, just, just kind of a lower cost option that's gotten a little bit more popular um, in recent years uh, for a number of different reasons. But these kits that are for sale through Home Depot, Amazon, some other retailers online, basically what they are is varying levels of kind of comp- complete homes um, and they come in pieces. So like you get, you know, a steel frame wall with like the OSB board already attached to it. And basically you're just kind of popping these four walls up and attaching and add siding, add a roof. And um, again, depending on how expensive and how complete the kit is that you get really determines how much you're going to get and how much extra you have to buy on your own. Yeah. When we first started talking about this, I was so excited. I've told you if you follow me on Instagram or anywhere. I talk a lot about tiny homes. I've stayed in them. I think they're so interesting. But when we were talking about this, we were saying it seems like a good situation, but there could be a catch with these pop-up tiny homes. Can you explain that? Yeah, that catch is kind of what we were just talking about, what's not included, right? So, you know, one of the ones that I was looking at is is from Home Depot. It's $54,000 and it, it's, it's, you know, uh, basically a shell, right? It's, it's everything to keep the inside weatherproofed. So you get you get doors, you get windows, you get, you know, the siding and the roof material and obviously all the walls that hold that up. But beyond that, it's really on you to pick flooring, walls, fixtures, appliances, everything else that's going to go in there that you can you can really think of. That stuff doesn't come with it. That's all, you know, and it'll say in the listing, you can get most stuff at Home Depot that you need to finish out this house. So, you know, that that was kind of one of the things that we were looking at. That $54,000 price tag is kind of attractive when you look mm-hmm. at it. And then you start looking at the, the details and, and what doesn't come with it. And, and you're like, oh, well, there's a lot, lot left out. And those things can really start to add up. So how much are we talking here? It could be as much as two to three, maybe more uh, times expensive as what that list price is. So you're talking wow. 54000 for that shell. I mean, it could easily get up to 150000 if you're talking about all those fixtures and and interior pieces, but also connecting to utilities, um, power, uh, water, sewer, and then having a a proper foundation poured or built to put it on. Those are some of the most expensive things uh, when we were talking to experts that that just aren't included. And um, you you have to account for all that kind of stuff when you're you're going to a total cost. And a lot of times you don't think of of the other stuff that you're going to get as being more expensive than this $54,000 shell that you're purchasing. But in in this case, it it can be. Yeah. When I was looking into these, it was land that was seeming to be really expensive because you have to put this house somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so then you're still technically kind of renting from someone, (laughs) but you have this home. Um, So when we're talking about these houses, are they actually more affordable then than a townhome or a condo, something that's turnkey but still smallish and good for one or two people? And and that land is a big part of of the answer to this question. And and the answer is complicated because there's so many factors, like how much of this are you going to do on your own, really? Like how much can you reasonably do? Um, are you building it on your own property? Are you renting it out? Are you, do you have land where you just need to put like a, I don't know, a vacation home or or something along those lines? There are so many variables. It can be cost effective to do one of these kits. You just need to be really technically inclined and handy and, and, you know, know, know the things that you need to know to, to, you know, get this permitted and inspected and done the right way. Otherwise, you could run into to problems with that kind of stuff that could cost you even more money. Yeah, and go into it knowing that this is not going to be you pop up these walls and then you're living there that night. Right, yeah, It's and, and that's not the final price tag, right? I mean, you, you could probably put it together pretty quick, like once you get it. Um, 
but you got to have the foundation like to start and you got to have all those those lines run for all the other utilities and stuff and, and, and just know going into that. There's a lot of planning and stuff that you need to know going into that um, if you're going to do one of these. And it isn't really marketed that way. It, it's not. It's definitely marketed as DIY. And I think one of the listings I was just looking at in the, the headline title, uh, easy to install, you know, just uh, they make it sound really, really simple to do. And I think that's one of the things that would draw people into it. Um, and you really just hope that everybody's reading all that fine print and, and details before they, they click purchase. Yeah, yeah. So there's some interesting history with these kits. Talk to me about that Sears catalog and some of the ties to Raleigh. It, it's cool. Like the Sears Roebuck um, kit homes of old. Uh, I mean, we're talking back in the 1910s, 20s, 30s. Um, it, it, they just had catalogs and, and it was everything for the most part, you know, like all the, the interior moldings and, and different kinds of stuff, the trim work and things like that. It, 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 they'd have all the stuff listed out and how much everything costs. And, um, you know, they had ship it to you. It's crazy cheap. I mean, some of them were like you know, three bedroom house for like $886 or something like that. I mean, yeah, it, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I would like a time machine right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, some of them are really incredible. And there are a lot of them that are still in the area, in the Raleigh area. Um, Mordecai uh, especially has several uh, of these different types of Sears kit homes that are still standing, still um, look great. Um, you know, really, really cool. One of our um, our managers lives in one of them. Um, and so it's... Uh, it's just a really interesting juxtaposition of history and how Sears used to do their kit homes and how much kind of came with that for the price compared to now. Obviously, there's inflation and things like that. Prices go up over time. But but just what you're getting for your money now compared to back then and, and looking at things 100 years difference um, is it, just kind of neat. Do they look more homey and less boxy like the current ones do? I think that the current ones kind of look like shipping containers, right? That's like the... The normal kind of look when you see a lot of these. So are these other ones like in Mordecai and stuff? Would I know it's one of these? Because you're saying that um, and I have no idea. Th- there's a lot of them. I mean, I-, I don't think that you'd specifically look at it and be, and be like, oh, oh. I mean, unless you're like into, into the architecture and the knowing kind of the history of them. They had so many different options, though. I mean, it looks the variety. I, I want to say is something around 400 plus different homes wow. and floor plans that they sold over about a 30 year period. Um, they're really cool. They're beautiful homes, um, you know, really well done. And like I said, you put in an order and they just ship you what you need and, and you, you know, you can put most of it. Obviously there's going to be some stuff that doesn't come with it, but um, yeah, just, just a really cool kind of trip through history and, and researching on the story. I'm going to go home hunting to look just <laughs> yeah. for those yeah. later today. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. Pritch, you talked to a lot of people about this, many people who had these homes. Um, who are some of those people who you talked with and what made them interested in living in tiny houses? So actually, the people that we ran into were really doing this as, as rental properties. They they had existing homes, full-size homes that they were living in. Um, and what they decided to do was to add um, secondary homes on their property that mm-hmm. could be used for rentals. Um, you know, for varying different reasons, but that that was really their motivation in doing it. It wasn't their primary residence, but you know, they they saw that they could do some good with those extra units, um, extra spaces to live, and and that was why they they decided to go the route that they did. And what has their experience been like? Did they use some of these pop up kits, or how do they kind of go about getting these built? So one of the women that we spoke with, who's having a tiny house built, she looked at them and and really found. The same thing that we were kind of talking about that like that shell, I mean, it's, it's got a good look to it to a lot of them. I mean, they're, they're good looking homes, um, but just found that there was a lot more that needed to be done. And, and it wasn't for her because really, it, and in talking to the builder too, the framing part of it isn't where they, they lose a lot of time and they just don't need that prefabricated frame to come in to, to really get things moving. It doesn't... It, it's an extra cost. It doesn't save a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so she avoided it. She ended up going stick built, which is just building the frame from scratch, um, you know, two by fours and, and all that good stuff. So that was how they ended up going um, just kind of after researching and looking at all the options. And, you know, that's their preference. Uh, it, it, if somebody's a little more, like I said, technically inclined to do it on their own, then then buying the kit may be for them. Did she find it to be cost effective? 
Found it to be about the same. Okay. Um, you know, the cost, it wasn't going to help her to go with a kit home, I guess, is kind of the thing. So she opted for using a builder who built um, custom stick built from scratch, from the beginning, um, as opposed to buying that kit and having the builder kind of need to make adjustments and figure out how to put that kit together uh, was her decision. So these houses are a solution for some people if maybe they want to do some rental properties or something like that. And they actually are kind of a good idea when you're thinking about the housing market. So how can these homes help with the areas and the country's housing issues? Yeah, I mean, it offers relatively affordable housing. Um, you know, the space isn't huge. The house that um, we were talking about with uh, one of them was under 300 square feet and the other one was, I think, a little bit over. Um, but, you know, the price per square foot as far as like rental, this is, it's they're renting below market rate, at least in Durham from what we were talking with the builder, um, Coram Houses, um, Topher Thomas. That's what he was telling us as, as far as the rental. So, it certainly opens up some options, um, you know, because you're able to put them up where existing homes are, and, and essentially you're, you're doubling the the occupancy and capacity of of an existing property line and lot. Um, and you know, like Raleigh has made adjustments to allow ADUs um, and essentially take advantage of that, being able to put additional structures on properties so that people can have some more affordable rental options. Yeah, and when looking at the Raleigh data, they're in these locations that are prime real estate that a first-time home buyer like myself could not really afford to live in. Right. So it's having that opportunity still to live in these neighborhoods where you want to be but really can't afford. And, and it's, yeah, and you know, with some of those neighborhoods, it's still going to come down to what the HOA decides. I mean, they're going to have have power in that respect as far as what they're going to allow. But yeah, I mean, as far as the city is concerned, they've, they've laid out some guidelines um, as far as how you can do this. So it, it is an option. So what made you interested in looking into this story? Have you ever stayed in a tiny home? And do you have any stories to share? I, I have <laughs> stayed in a tiny home. I, I stayed in one uh, in Asheville and, and it was cool. I liked it a lot. Um, the water heater would left something to be desired. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I, I, I had a good experience with it. I really kind of wanted to look into this uh, when this came up because I've got a shed in my backyard. I, you know, I'm, you know, to reveal too much about myself, I'm in my late thirties. I've got three kids and I'm kind of a DIY guy. I (laughs) thought about doing something like this, replacing the shed that we have out there with a space that's, you know, a little bit more habitable that you can kind of, you know, get out to if you needed a a little break. But man, after looking through all this, it's, it's tricky, you know. I mean, you really got to know what you're doing, and I it, it's it's over my head as far as my capabilities. So, you know, I figured somebody who's who's you know my age bracket has kids has looked at something like this, thought about it. It'd be a cool topic to explore, and I I think it was. I learned a lot. I also learned that it is it is a little bit more than than I would be able to handle. I think. Well. Uh, maybe someday you'll get out there and you can have fun in your shed (laughs) until then. We'll see. (laughs) Thanks so much, Fritz, for joining me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for listening to the WRAL Daily Download. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can find more podcasts from WRAL News at WRAL.com. Search podcast. From sports to true crime, there are plenty of shows to keep you informed and entertained. Thanks for listening.